Section 4 of Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met. By William Wells Brown. Letter 4. Versailles, The Palace, Second Session of the Congress, Mr. Cobden, Henry Vincent, Monsieur Girardin, Abbe Duguerre, Victor Hugo, His Speech. Versailles, August 24. After the convention had finished its sittings yesterday, I accompanied Mrs. M. C. Blank, and sisters, to Versailles, where they are residing during the summer. It was really pleasing to see among the hundreds of strange faces in the convention those distinguished friends of the slave from Boston. Mrs. C.'s residence is directly in front of the great palace, where so many kings have made their homes, the prince of whom was Louis the Fourteenth. The palace is now unoccupied. No ruler has dared to take up his residence here since Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette were driven from it by the mob from Paris on the 8th of October, 1789. The town looks like the wreck of what it once was. At the commencement of the First Revolution, it contained 100,000 inhabitants. Now it has only about 30,000. It seems to be going back to what it was in the time of Louis the Thirteenth, when, in 1624, he built a small brick chateau, and from it arose the magnificent palace, which now stands here, and which attracts strangers to it from all parts of the world. I arose this morning before the sun, and took a walk through the grounds of the palace, and remained three hours among the fountains and statuary, of this more than splendid place. But as I intend spending some days here, and shall have better opportunities of seeing and judging, I will defer my remarks upon Versailles for the present. Yesterday was a great day in the Congress. The session was opened by a speech from Monsieur Coquerel, the Protestant clergyman in Paris. His speech was received with much applause, and seemed to create great sensation in the Congress, especially at the close of his remarks, when he was seized by the hand by the Abbe du Guéret, amid the most deafening and enthusiastic applause of the entire multitude. The meeting was then addressed in English by a short gentleman of florid complexion. His words seemed to come without the least difficulty, and his gestures, though somewhat violent, were evidently studied and the applause with which he was greeted by the English delegation showed that he was a man of no little distinction among them. His speech was one continuous flow of rapid, fervid eloquence that seemed to fire every heart, and although I disliked his style, I was prepossessed in his favor. This was Henry Vincent, and his speech was in favor of disarmament. Mr. Vincent was followed by Monsieur Emile de Girardin, the editor of La Presse, in one of the most eloquent speeches that I ever heard, and his exclamation of soldiers of peace drew thunders of applause from his own countrymen. Monsieur Girardin is not only the leader of the French press, but is a writer on politics of great distinction, and a leader of no inconsiderable party in the National Assembly although still a young man, apparently not more than thirty-eight or forty years of age. After a speech from Mr. Ewart, M.P., in French, and another from Mr. Cobden, in the same language, the convention was brought to a close for the day. I spent the morning yesterday in visiting some of the lions of the French capital, among which was the Louvre, the French government, having kindly ordered that the members of the Peace Congress should be admitted free, and without ticket, to all the public works, I had nothing to do but present my card of membership, and was immediately admitted. 
The first room I entered was nearly a quarter of a mile in length, is known as the Long Gallery, and contains some of the finest paintings in the world. On entering this superb palace, my first impression was that all Christendom had been robbed, that the Louvre might make a splendid appearance. This is the Italian department, and one would suppose by its appearance that but few paintings had been left in Italy. The entrance end of the Louvre was for a long time in an unfinished state, but was afterwards completed by that master workman, the Emperor Napoleon. It was long thought that the building would crumble into decay, but the genius of the great Corsican rescued it from ruin. During our walk through the Louvre, we saw some twenty or thirty artists copying paintings. Some had their copies finished and were going out, others half done, while many had just commenced. I remained some minutes near a pretty French girl, who was copying a painting of a dog rescuing a child from a stream of water into which it had fallen. I walked down one side of the hall and up the other, and was about leaving when I was informed that this was only one room, and that a half dozen more were at my service. But a clock on a neighboring church reminded me that I must quit the Louvre for the Salle de Saint-Cécile. This morning, the hall was filled at an early hour with rather a more fashionable-looking audience than on any former occasion, and all appeared anxious for the Congress to commence its session, as it was understood to be the last day. After the reading of several letters from gentlemen apologizing for their not being able to attend, the speech of Elihu Burit was read by a son of Monsieur Coquerel. I felt somewhat astonished that my countryman, who was said to be master of fifty languages, had to get someone to read his speech in French. The Abbe du Garret now came forward amid great cheering, and said that the eminent journalist Girardin and the great English logician Mr. Cobden had made it unnecessary for any further advocacy in that assembly of the peace cause, that if the principles laid down in the resolutions were carried out, the work would be done. He said that the question of general pacification was built on truth, truth which emanated from God, and it were as vain to undertake to prevent air from expanding as to check the progress of truth. It must and would prevail. A pale, thin-faced gentleman next ascended the platform, or tribune, as it was called, amid shouts of applause from the English, and began his speech in rather a low tone, when compared with the sharp voice of Vincent, or the thunder of the Abbe du Garret. An audience is not apt to be pleased, or even contented with an inferior speaker, when surrounded by eloquent men and I looked every moment for manifestations of disapprobation, as I felt certain that the English delegation had made a mistake in applauding this gentleman who seemed to make such an unpromising beginning. But the speaker soon began to get warm on the subject, and even at times appeared as if he had spoken before. In a very short time, with the exception of his own voice, the stillness of death prevailed throughout the building. The speaker, in the delivery of one of the most logical speeches made in the Congress, and despite of his thin, sallow look, interested me much more than any whom I had before heard. Towards the close of his remarks, he was several times interrupted by manifestations of approbation, and finally concluded, amid great cheering. I inquired the gentleman's name, and was informed that it was Edward Mial editor of the nonconformist after speeches from several others the great peace congress of eighteen forty nine which had brought men together from nearly all the governments of europe and many from america was brought to a final close by a speech from the president returning thanks for the honor that had been conferred upon him he said my address shall be short and yet i have to bid you adieu how resolve to do so. Here, during three days, have questions of the deepest import been discussed, examined, 
probed to the bottom, and during these discussions, councils have been given to governments which they will do well to profit by. If these days' sittings are attended with no other result, they will be the means of sowing in the minds of those present gems of cordiality which must ripen into good fruit. England, France, Belgium, Europe, and America would all be drawn closer by these sittings. Yet the moment to part has arrived, but I can feel that we are strongly united in heart. But before parting, I may congratulate you and myself on the result of our proceedings. We have been all joined together without distinction of country. We have all been united in one common feeling during our three days' communion. The good work cannot go back. It must advance. It must be accomplished. The course of the future may be judged of by the sound of the footsteps of the past. In the course of that day's discussion, a reminiscence had been handed up to one of the speakers that this was the anniversary of the dreadful massacre of St. Bartholomew. The reverend gentleman who was speaking turned away from the thought of that sanguinary scene with pious horror natural to his sacred calling. But I, who may boast of firmer nerve, I take up the remembrance. Yes, it was on this day, two hundred and seventy-seven years ago, that Paris was roused from slumber by the sound of that bell which bore the name of Cloche d'Argent. Massacre was on foot, seeking with keen eye for its victim. Man was busy in slaying man. That slaughter was called forth by mingled passions of the worst description. Hatred of all kinds was there, urging on the slayer, hatred of a religious, a political, a personal character. And yet, on the anniversary of that same day of horror, and in that very city whose blood was flowing like water, has God this day given a rendezvous to men of peace, whose wild tumult is transformed into order, and animosity into love. The stain of blood is blotted out, and in its place beams forth a ray of holy light. All distinctions are removed, and Papist and Huguenot meet together in friendly communion. Loud cheers. Who that thinks of these amazing changes can doubt of the progress that has been made? But whoever denies the force of progress must deny God, since progress is the boon of providence, and emanated from the great being above. I feel gratified for the change that has been effected, and, pointing solemnly to the past, I say, let this day be ever held memorable. Let the 24th of August, 1572, be remembered only for the purpose of being compared with the 24th of August, 1849. And when we think of the latter, and ponder over the high purpose to which it has been devoted, the advocacy of the principles of peace, let us not be so wanting in reliance on providence as to doubt for one moment of the eventful success of our holy cause. The most enthusiastic cheers followed this interesting speech. A vote of thanks to the government and three times three cheers, with Mr. Cobden as Fugelman, ended the Great Peace Congress of 1849. Time for separating had arrived, yet all seemed unwilling to leave the place, where for three days men of all creeds and of no creed had met upon one common platform. In one sense, the meeting was a glorious one. In another, it was mere child's play, for the Congress had been restricted to the discussion of certain topics. They were permitted to dwell on the blessings of peace, but were not allowed to say anything about the very subjects above all others that should have been brought before the Congress. A French army had invaded Rome and put down the friends of political and religious freedom, yet not a word was said in reference to it. The fact is, the committee permitted the Congress to be gagged before it had met. They put padlocks upon their own mouths and handed the keys to the government, and this was sorely felt by many of the speakers. Richard Cobden, 
who had thundered his anathemas against the corn laws of his own country, and against wars in every clime, had to sit quiet in his fetters. Henry Vincent, who can make a louder speech in favor of peace than almost any other man, and whose denunciations of all war have gained him no little celebrity with peacemen, had to confine himself to the blessings of peace. Oh, how I wished for a Massachusetts atmosphere, a New England convention platform, with Wendell Phillips as the speaker, before that assembled multitude from all parts of the world. But the Congress is over, and cannot now be made different. Yet it is to be hoped that neither the London Peace Committee, nor any other men having the charge of getting up such another great meeting, will commit such an error again. End of Letter 4 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista